بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله نحمده حمد الشاكرين ونستغفره استغفار المذنبين المقصرين ونصلي ونسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيد الأولين والآخرين وإمام الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Dear respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In the previous episode, we started to speak about the story of Sila ibn al-Ashyam, or Sila ibn Ashyam. Sila ibn Ashyam is or was one of the tabi'een, was one of the companions of Abdullah ibn Abbas, or he studied with Abdullah ibn Abbas, and he studied as well with Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And that's why he is considered to be one of the second generation. The first generation is the Sahaba, the second generation is the Tabi'een. Sayyid ibn al-Ashyam, he was a great person, yet he was not a scholar. He was a mujahid and he died as a shaheed. Many scholars praised him because of the jihad he used to carry. And radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was a person of piety and righteousness and a lot of ibadah. We mentioned that he used to have a number of karamat, karamat, extraordinary things that Allah Jalla wa Ala honor certain people, certain pious people with. Salah ibn al-Ashyam radiallahu ta'ala anhu once told his wife, I advise you to make remembrance of death as your habit. Make it your habit to remember death a lot. Once you do this, then you will not be worried about your days. You will not be worried about your life, whether in the morning you had provision or you don't have provision. You will have peace and contentment. This is what he means. This is what he meant. And as Ayyub al sakhtiani and it was narrated even uh, through uh, or by number of scholars. Uh, Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib, Ayyub al sakhtiani uh, Muhammad ibn Sirin, others, statements that mean if I neglect remembrance, death, then I would fear for my heart. I would fear for my heart. I would fear that my heart will be spoiled. This is what they used to say. That's why the Prophet وسلم, or this is because the Prophet وسلم, said, remember death a lot. Remember death a lot because it, it, it strikes the balance. If a person is living a luxury, comfortable life and he is neglectful to death, then once he remembers death, then he will be a balanced person. Uh, being living or living in a very luxurious life, forgetting about death, uh, enjoying his time, wasting his time. Once he remember death, it will demolish these desires in order to what? To bring him to balance. And also the Prophet وسلم, said, if a person living in a difficulty, and he is really stressful because of uh, the difficult situation he is living or she is living in. Once he or she remembers death, then this brings him back to the normal balanced life. So that's why the Tabi'een, the Sahaba, all righteous people always remember death. I know, brothers and sisters, that many of us avoid remembering death because they think that it spoils their life. No, remembering death does not spoil your life. In fact, remembering death brings you and puts you on the right track. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, remember death a lot, udhkuru, which means that as if it is wajib, as if it is obligatory upon us to remember death a lot. Why? Because of the benefits that we get once we remember death a lot. Not because of the harms that, uh, obviously, uh, not because of the harms that uh, remembering death might bring to us. Uh, 
And I know that some people, especially who are living in uh, among non-Muslims, because non-Muslims themselves, they try to avoid remembering death. But, uh, and some Muslims took this from them and they started to avoid remembering death. This is not right. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ encouraged us to visit graveyards. Why? Because we will remember death and we will go back to our reality. That we are just human beings who are going to die. And Allah says in the Quran, كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ Each soul will taste death. And Allah says in the Quran, قُلْ فَدْرَأُوا عَنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ Deter death if you can. Deter death. No one can deter death. No one can delay the time the uh, angel comes to take his life. Sila ibn al-Ashyam, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, he was a mujahid fi sabilillah. And he was a very pious person. He used to take any opportunity, especially opportunities related to death, to remind himself of death and to remind others of the reality of life. Al-Hasan al-Basri, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, said, one time we buried one of our brothers. And then when we covered his grave, Sila ibn al-Ashyam just looked beneath the clothes that they used to uh, use for covering the grave. And he looked at the person in the grave. He looked at the person in the grave. Uh, and he said, he said, if you can be safe now, if you can be safe now, then all of us will be safe. A statement like this, to remind others. Why? Because no one will be safe at the day of resurrection. No one will be safe in his grave except whom Allah Jalla wa ala granted mercy. And we don't know this. That's why we need to work hard to be safe at that time. Uh, point. That's why Salah ibn al-Ashyam took that opportunity to give this advice and then they said all of us started to uh, cry. He cried and others used to cry as well. Salah ibn al-Ashyam once was in jihad. In fact, as we said, he was killed as a martyr in jihad. And the story is a very interesting story, very inspiring story, in fact. Uh, he was in jihad, and then the fight becomes really, became really heated fight between Muslims and enemies. So he said to his son, when the fight really became strong and tough, he said to his son, oh, my son, go first. Go participate in this fight first. Because if you were killed as a shaheed, and I see you being killed as a shaheed, I will have sabr, and I will ask Allah Jalla wa ala to compensate you for this loss, to compensate me for this loss. You know that if a person sees a musiba, witnesses a musiba, and he experiences or he exercises patience and sabr, Allah Jalla wa ala will give him a lot of reward because of the sabr, because of the sabr that he had when he witnessed that musibah. In particular, the musibah of losing children. And that's why, you know, in the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ, when he said, if, uh, if Allah Jalla wa ala takes the life of three children, three of your children, Allah Jalla wa ala will grant you Jannah. Then the Sahaba said, what about two, Ya Rasulullah? Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said two. In one narration, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Allah grants Jannah for a person who loses one of his children and remains, remains patient. So, Sila ibn al-Ashyam wants to take, to take this opportunity. He wanted to make use of this opportunity. And this is, subhanAllah, a very great dars, very great lesson for us brothers and sisters that whenever there is an opportunity to gain more hasanat, do it. You don't know which hasana will be accepted, ya brothers and sisters. You never knew which hasana will be accepted. That's why if you have any opportunity to gain hasanat, to do good deeds, do it. 
Sayyid ibn al-Asham could have said that he will die as a shaheed or he is coming for jihad. Why does he need to uh, get hasanat by being patient when he sees his son being killed in front of him? But if that opportunity is there, why not? So he said to his son, oh, go first. If you are killed and I witness you being killed, then I have sabr, I will have the reward from Allah Jalla wa ala. And in fact, this is what happened. And he left and he was killed. And Sal ibn al-Ashyam saw him when he was killed. So he got that blessings from Allah Jalla wa ala by being patient when he lost his son. Then after that, Sal ibn al-Ashyam went for jihad. We said that it was tough fight at that point and then he was killed as a shaheed as a martyr and you know that the shaheed is of the highest grade in jannah and you know that the prophet ﷺ said there is no one who dies and wants to go back to dunya except the shaheed he would like to go back to dunya and to be killed as a shaheed again and to go back to dunya and to be killed as a shaheed again and to go back to dunya and to be killed as a shaheed again and again why because of the what the bounties that Allah Jalla wa ala give to a shaheed uh, Sal ibn al Asham has a very pious woman and he took care of that woman he took care of his wife and we mentioned his advice to his wife to remember death a lot, to make remembrance of death as her habit. His wife is known as Mu'adha al-Adawiyah. Mu'adha al-Adawiyah. The scholar said that she was one of the honorable women in Islam, one of the honorable ladies of Tabi'een, of the second generation. They said that she reported the number of ahadith from Abi Huraira and she reported number of ahadith from Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. And they said, in fact, she is among the trustworthy narrators of the ahadith, among the trustworthy narrators of the ahadith. And they, they mentioned, the Habi mentioned that she had number of ahadith in all the six main books al-Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, Al-Tirmidhi, Al-Nasai and Ibn Majah. She narrated the number of ahadith and those ahadith were mentioned or were recorded in these, uh, in these uh, six books. The brothers are telling me that we are running off out of time. Inshallah, let us have a short break and we will continue the story of Mu'adha al-Adawiyya, the wife of Sila ibn al-Asham after the break. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Real Talk Cafe is a place where young people get together to share their thoughts and ideas Islam about the crazy has world continued. in which they live in. When we have had correct leadership produced societies that have benefited all humanity. The program is not designed to get into the halal and haram of music because it's not, it's not what I want to get into. So I, I would take my CDs from the car the, and then to the house, to the office and you know triangulate because I needed it. You know fast food is killing you, uh, even the normal food that you're going at home with all the preservatives and uh, uh, you know you know chemical subsidies they have to put in there to keep it fresh and what not? They say, well, you know, I'm just simply choosing my poison now. A lot of people I know, they just mouth smoke. Just so, because, you know, cool guys, they're standing and talking around, they all smoke. So, you know, that sort of socializing thing is a huge factor. <laughs> the entire staff at Hoda would like to wish you a wonderful and blessed Ramadan. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back, brothers and sisters. Just before the break, we were talking about the wife of Sila ibn al Ashim. His wife is Mu'adha bint Abdullah al Adawiyah. We said that she was among the greatest scholars. 
In fact, she narrated the number of ahadith, and her ahadith are recorded in the six main books of ahadith. And that's why they considered her as one of the trustworthy scholars who are credible to narrate authentic ahadith. She had a number of teachers. She narrated a number of ahadith from Abi Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anha, anhu, and a number of ahadith from Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. In fact, she had a number of great scholars, of great students, great scholars who were great students for her. Al-Hasan al-Basri, we know who Al-Hasan al-Basri was. He was one of the great tabi'een. In fact, some of the scholars said that he was the greatest of the tabi'een. Among her students is Ayyub al-Sikhtiyani, is again one of the great tabi'een. And also the very famous Mufassir Qatada bin Da'ama uh, al-Sadusi, he was one of the great Mufassirs of the Qur'an. Uh, Mu'adha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she used to be as well a very, a very pious lady, doing a lot of ibadah for Allah jalla wa ala. And they said that after her husband passed away, she never slept. After her husband passed away, she never slept. Here I know that some people might say, what, she never slept? Uh, either if we can understood, understand this literally, that literally she did not, she never slept after her husband died, or she slept for very little amount of time. And she used to say, I am surprised of those people who sleep deeply and they know that the only time to sleep is when you go to bed that is the sleeping time uh, sorry when you go to the grave that is the real sleeping time here i would like to say something <laughs> that some people brothers and sisters might not have many things to do in their life so those people if they can expand their ibadah and do a lot of ibadah then there is no harm whatsoever this is not an excessive ibadah that might be considered as bid'ah <coughs> let me give you an example uh, some of the brothers were uh, imprisoned in america unlawfully or lawfully and they said that they will remain in custody for 20 years, 25 years. <clears throat> so for those people in prison, what are they going to do? They don't have much to do. So if those people devoted themselves to do ibadat, so if they were able to fast continuously, then there is no harm because fasting will not stop them from doing other activities. If they were praying most of their time, and they can pray 1,000 rak'ah a day, if that is possible. We uh, narrated uh, some of the narrations where some of the uh, tabi'een used to pray 1,000 rak'ah. We said that Ali ibn al-Hasan was reported to pray 1,000 rak'ah a day. Not necessarily every day, but it happened. So such people, if they can do something like this, then why not? Some elderly people, who still are healthy. And those people, they don't eat much anyway. So if those people can fast continuously, what is the harm? I attended some of the elders who most of their time are fasting. I attended some people, some elders, who do not have anything in their life. They, their children grown up. They don't have a job for whatever reason. And uh, they have good income, and that's it. So those people, why do they lose their time in other things? And they are not good du'at, they are not big scholars, they cannot do da'wah because they don't have that knowledge, or they are in a situation where they can't do much da'wah. So those people, why don't they devote themselves for more ibadat? As I told you, I, did, I, I witnessed a person or I knew of a person who was a little bit old, not that old, and he used to fast almost 
uh, every day. Another person whom I came to know, he was doing a lot of dhikr. That person, I remember him, may Allah Jalla wa ala have mercy on him. Uh, he was illiterate. He doesn't know how to read, subhanAllah. And that person, I never attended him with his tongue quiet. All what he do is just make dhikr of Allah Jalla wa ala, tasbih. Or all what he do is to repeat the Quran that he knows. To repeat the Quran that he knows. Some uh, scholars told me that they attended some uh, scholars who every almost, you, who used to do uh, a lot of Qiyamul Layl. And they said that some of them, they used to pray two to three to four hours every day, continuously, every single day they pray Qiyamul Layl for four hours. Not in Ramadan, but outside Ramadan. Now, don't think that this is excessive ibadah. We say that if the person can do this ibadah and the ibadah does not stop him from other things, then why not? And Sayyid uh, ibn al-Ashyam himself, the husband of Mu'adha, he said one time, I don't know which day is better for me. The day where I start by the dhikr of Allah Jalla wa ala, or the day that I start by going to uh, seek provision, seek rizq from Allah Jalla wa ala. Which day is better? Which means that himself, while he was a very righteous person, was very devout person, himself he used to go for rizq. And he used to see that going for rizq is not necessarily of less, uh, less virtuous than going for dhikr of Allah Jalla wa ala or devouting himself on that day for ibadah. In fact, there are many statements where the Salaf themselves encouraged people to go and seek rizq from Allah Jalla wa ala. And even some of them, they said that uh, seeking rizq from Allah Jalla wa ala is far better than just devouting yourself for ibadah and then you will leave yourself in need for other people and inshallah in, we might mention some of those uh, stories. Mu'adha al-Adawiyya radiyallahu ta'ala anha when she received the news that her husband and her son were killed she remained patient and she accepted this. And when a group of women came to give her condolences for that loss, she said, if you are coming to give me the condolences for the loss, then don't come. But if you are giving me the glad tidings of those uh, people that I lost, my husband and my son, the glad tidings that they were killed as shaheed, then you are welcome to do so. The, she was a very great lady. In fact, brothers and sisters, we heard now that there were some mothers who lost their children as shaheed in some places in Palestine and in other places. And when they received the news that their children were killed as shaheed, they were thanking Allah Jalla that their children were killed as shaheed and they didn't just die as normal people. And some of them said that, Alhamdulillah, this son, he will be a shafi' for me at the day of resurrection. He might intercede for me, give me intercession at the day of resurrection. And as you know, brothers and sisters, that the shaheed gives intercession for 70 people. Allah Jalla wa Ala accept his intercession for 70 people from his uh, family and relatives. So Mu'adha al-Adawiyya radiyallahu ta'ala anha accepted this and she used to say, I don't like to stay in this dunya except to do more hasanat in order to be with my husband Sila and with my son. So we ask Allah jalla wa ala to gather her together along with her son, along with her husband. And we ask Allah Jalla wa ala to make us, uh, of, uh, to, we ask Allah Jalla wa ala to give us the ability to follow this role model. And we ask Allah Jalla wa ala to set among our women, our, among our mothers, among our 
daughters among our sisters, women like Mu'adha al-Adawiyya radiyallahu ta'ala anha. This is, this is not uh, impossible. In fact, you know that Allah jalla wa'ala is able to do anything. I will leave you now because it is the end of this episode. It is the end of the story of Sila ibn al-Ashyam and his wife. Uh, until I see you, insha'Allah, in the coming episode, I say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.